Hi, folks. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Although, probably done a couple meetings already, I know. But welcome to breakfast, brunch at uh, Under the Radar Symposium at Joe's Pub. And I want to thank Alex Knowlton and Shanta Fake for allowing us to be in here. Um, I'm here just to introduce why my uh, close, close associate uh, today. Uh, he has uh, been working on Under the Radar since we came to the public. So that's like 14 years. And I call him my consigliere. And if you've seen The Godfather, you know what I'm talking about. And he's a production um, dramaturg, which is something we're trying to promote. Because he not only goes into the text of why uh, uh, and helps people with text, but also the whole makeup of a show. And I think that's important for you to start to look at the making of theater. So please welcome my close associate, Andrew Kirchner. He's going to take you through the day. I need Mark to precede everything I do in my life. That was so generous. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you all for coming. Day three of Under the Radar Festival. I hope you're having a good time. Um, yes, yeah. Um, so uh, Coming Attractions is our chance to share with you all a little bit of what we're excited about, some projects we think you really should have your, your eyes on. And since I have your attention, I'll also say that uh, the incoming series uh, features another group of artists that we really passionately want you to know about. We want you to see what they're doing. They're making amazing work, and that is with the generous support of Drone Foundation as well. So um, please be sure to check out their shows. We have marathons at your convenience today and tomorrow, so if you are a glutton, you can see all six incoming shows over two days. Um, so that, that is my pitch. I'll get that out of the way. And now um, we're going to have four different pitches today. Uh, one of them, Catherine Hamilton's, is going to sort of trace through the entire uh, event. That is to say she'll come and go, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, and without further ado, I will actually welcome her to the stage, Catherine Hamilton. a new genre of theatre here tonight, genetically modified theatre, uh, and tonight's performance, the true performance, is going to take place in your small intestine, and it will be a collaboration between a dead German actor, a bioluminescing jellyfish, and you. Uh, that's not actually a dead German actor, that's Clark Gable, but it's the best photo I could find, so pretend for now. Um, but before we get started on Breck Forensics, I want to give you a little bit of context about the company so you can uh, understand where we're coming from with this new performance. Uh, so first of all, this is an image from a play that we made called The Maid, The Maid. This is a reinterpretation of Jean Genet's text, The Maid, uh, but in collaboration with professional housekeepers in New York City. And I show you this because uh, we have a series of works where we're bringing classic texts into collision with the contemporary version of the real world that they represent. Uh, and Breck Forensics is another example of this kind of idea. The second piece I'll show you uh, is from The Fall. Uh, this is the most recent piece we performed. We did this at the American Association for Theatre and Higher Education this summer in Boston. Uh, and we also performed it at this festival a few years ago. This is uh, an investigation into a film, a cult British film, that is reported to have caused a revolution in Greece. And I bring this up because it's an example of uh, the work that we do that, that uses research quite heavily. In this piece, we use journalistic research. Uh, we also use archival research. And in Breck Forensics, as you'll see, it's scientific research. Uh, and another reason I bring this one up is because, as you can see, there's a chicken in it. Um, we have a series of works as well that look at 
uh, cross-species collaboration. Uh, so in this piece, we work with a chicken. We've also worked with tortoises, uh, fish, dogs. And in Breck Forensics, we continue this interest in uh, non-human performance, as you'll see. So moving on to Breck Forensics. First, I want to tell you uh, how this piece came about. So this time last year, well, summer last year, I was in Berlin. It was the first time I'd ever been to Berlin, and top on my list of things to do was visit the Berliner Ensemble. Uh, this next slide is me looking very excited to meet Breck. Um, but when I got to the Berliner Ensemble, it was completely shut up. It was totally closed. All the doors were locked, uh, and there were signs like this one strewn around that said, thank you, farewell, it's over, it's the end. Uh, and I was really confused. So I took out my phone and I, I searched, and I found out that the Berliner Ensemble had shut down the night before. There was a, a kind of conflict of interest about how the, the theater would be run in the future, whether it would continue to do classic Breck plays or whether it would open up and start to uh, work with other material as well. And the, the people from like opening up the theater had won. In the meantime, the whole theater had shut down, they were changing directorship, and everything was closed. Uh, so I was heartbroken. Um, but I decided the least I could do was kind of walk around the edge of the theater and see the building itself. So I set off, I went under a barrier, and I started to walk around the edge of the theater. When I turned the corner, I saw a group of people sitting at picnic benches, drinking beers. It was about 11 in the morning. Um, they saw me too, and they said, what are you doing? This is private property. Why are you here? And I explained, well, I really, really wanted to see the Berliner Ensemble. I came all this way to see it, and I'm so sad it's shut. And one of these people uh, stood up from the picnic table, slightly drunkenly, and said, well, you're in luck, because I have the keys. <laughs> and so uh, it turns out this was a group of technicians. They were loading out after their final shift the night before, and they were having a final farewell beer to say goodbye to the old regime. Uh, and so this drunken technician uh, unlocked the theater and took me on a tour from the basement where uh, the Berliner... Who, who, has anyone here been to the Berliner Ensemble? Right, so down in the basement, the, the rotating stage is still operated by old Russian tank wheels um, because it was a theater that was built just from the detritus of, of the Second World War. Whatever they could find, they used to build it. Um, we went up to Brett's office. Uh, they let me pull Mother Courage's cart. Yeah, it was really exciting. <laughs> Uh, and then at some point on the tour, the technician started to get a little bit maudlin. He started to get a bit sad. He said, you know, no one cares about this stuff anymore. No one cares about the history. He said, for example, uh, and he picked up a hat off the table. This hat, this hat has been in the company since 1949. It was a costume for a soldier, and Brecht said it could never be washed because he wanted it to stink like the war. But no one cares about this anymore. And then he looked at me, and he went, wait a second, you care. Here, take it, take the hat. Put it under your jacket and take it. And so I did. Uh, and here it is. Um, and so I had this hat, and I got quite excited because I thought, well, this hat, if it's not been washed since 1949, it must be an archive. It must be a collection of all the different people who've interacted with it. It must somehow have their DNA still on it. And then I got even more excited because I remembered that Brecht quote about him wanting theatre to be a science experiment. He's got. Here it is. Theatre for the scientific age he wanted to make, and he wanted his plays to be a science experiment. So I thought maybe I could combine these things and, uh, and extract DNA from the hat and then see what I could do with it, see how I could make that into a play. Um, there was one problem, though, which is that I'm not a biologist or a scientist of any kind, uh, and I hadn't been in a science lab since I was in high school. Um, so before I could do this, this, this investigation, I had to learn some microbiology. Um, and uh, right now, I'm going to go away. I'm going to collect together some science equipment. Uh, you're going to watch some other artists presenting. And when I come back together, we're going to extract DNA live on stage. Um, thank you very much. Right. <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Uh, now, please welcome to the stage Emily Johnson. woman who grew up on Denina and Kanaitsi land in Alaska. 
and I live now here on Manahatta in the Lenape Hoking. And I acknowledge and pay deep respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors present and of the past and coming in the future. And I give deep gratitude to the ground underneath us right now for holding us so that we can be here together. And when I leave here in six and a half minutes, I'm going over to Dance Space. And you're all welcome to join me at 12.30. We're having a welcome and an honoring ceremony with Lenape leaders. And we're welcoming all of our indigenous guests who are here from Australia and Canada, and the US and New Zealand. And we're honoring Spider Woman Theater and Amarinda. And we're having a feast and a protocol exchange. And please come. So I make dances. And they're these large social choreographies. And maybe I can describe what that is a little bit, but they're definitely rooted in dance. And some of you know that this is one of my signature moves. And so is this one. And because I'm Yupik, people always think this is a Yupik dance, but it's not. But this one is, and I am. But I'm usually saying your name also as I look right into your eyes. And this dance, yeah, this one coming up here is um, it's called Then a Cunning Voice and a Night We Spend Gazing at Stars. And for example, we spent uh, two years making 84 handmade quilts in community sewing bees across Australia and the US and Taiwan. And the quilts are inscribed with thousands of ideas of what people envision for their future. So what do you want for your well-being? What do you want for the well-being of your chosen friends and your family, or of your neighborhood, or your school, or your nation, or your world? And the performance is an attempt to bring these ideas into reality. And it's 15 hours long, this performance. It's outside, there are fires, there's a dinner that we make together, there's a round table conversation about homeland, there's breakfast and there's sunrise. And the whole night weaves together stories and performance with the exchange of ideas and the sharing of food and the endurance of spending a night together outside under the stars and the sky. And you're not meant to sleep during this night, but some people get cozy, and they do. And what I love is seeing some audience members who have just met other audience members, and they wrap them up in blankets and quilts. And that's how I know that the night is doing what it's supposed to do, because it's a night about practicing being in community. Because how do we make the world better if we don't know how to be together in a good way? Or how do we give thanks if we don't know whose ground we're standing on? So if you would all just stand up for a moment. And let's just stand together for a moment in gratitude. And let's just stand together in recognition of the fact that we are standing right now on stolen Lenape land. And let's just stand for a moment in contemplation of what we will do together in reparation of that fact. And I'd love to know if any of you remember that story I told you last time I was up here? You didn't see that show? Don't worry, I'll tell it again. There used to be a tree kind of right here in the center of the room. I mean, before this was a room, before this was a building. Mark Russell was telling me some history of the building and of the neighborhood, and so I went and I found 
pictures of this tree in historical records and stuff. And I don't know if this tree was a Lenape meeting place, but this theater certainly is. And places are always places that they've always been. And I think that I remember this tree in my bones. And yesterday I was standing right where you're standing, right where that tree used to be. And it was really early in the morning, it was tech, and I was standing there and I was looking up at the sky. I mean, not the sky, I was looking at the ceiling. I was thinking of the sky, I was looking at the ceiling, and I was standing here, I mean, right there, where you are, where the tree used to be, and I was thinking of the sky and looking at the ceiling, and I remember this dream that I had not too long ago. It was a couple years ago now. So I was standing here, I mean, right there, and I was looking up and thinking of this dream, and in my dream, there was a hawk flying. And in my dream, then I noticed there was a silver airplane flying way above the hawk. And I knew, of course, that the airplane was thousands of feet higher than the hawk, but from where I was standing, it looked like they might collide. And so I just had to stand there in my dream and wait until they passed. And the moment that they did, I had this sudden memory of the ground shifting beneath my feet, and I was in two places at once. I was here, and I was the tree. I was me, and I was the me before this me, and I was alive, and I wasn't yet born. I have been trying to think of the most joyous moment of my life, and I'm not sure I know what it is. My next dance is called um, Being Future Being. And it's for a stage, bigger than this one. And it's for a cast of more than human creatures. And it's going to be an alternate trajectory of creation myths, yet it's kind of a creation myth in and of itself. And I wanna examine in this piece the way the stories that we tell ourselves about how we came to be set the potentials for who we will become. And it's a work that seeks to rebuild new visions of the forces that brought this world into being. Because I always think we can make it better. <laughs> and it will move from the stage out into the world. And it's commissioned by Peak Performances at Montclair University. And it's co-commissioned by Bunnell Street Gallery, this amazing gallery in Homer, Alaska, quite near to where I grew up. And we're in the development and research phase, and we need more development and research time and place, and we need commissions and you. And this is George, and he can tell you more about it, and he might be able to tell you more about social choreographies as well. And thank you, Andrew and Ying and UTR and Joe's Pub. And I have to go welcome 300 people now. So please join me there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Um, now, please welcome to the stage from uh, Pig Iron, Dan Rothenberg and Mimi Lien. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Dan Rothenberg. Uh, I'm co-artistic director of Pig Iron Theatre Company. And uh, when you're ready. I'm Mimi Lien. I'm a set designer and company member of Pig Iron. Thank you. Uh, so let me know when we're up. Are we there? I don't think we're in presenter view yet. There we go. Cool. Sweet. Uh, so yeah. So. I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the company and the evolution of Mimi's and my collaboration, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mimi, who's the lead artist on this project, Superterranean. So Pig Iron's been making original work for 20 years uh, in our home of Philadelphia. Uh, we have two stops here at Under the Radar. Um, we make work about loneliness and death, but funny, and uh, most of the time. And uh, our first outing here was Chekhov Lizard Brain back in 2010. Pig Iron works with an ensemble of physical actors uh, and also with designers as core collaborators and co-authors in making the work. 
uh, in our devising process, and sometimes the work turns into formal dares and large-scale design interventions, which is where uh, the kind of project that Mimi and I uh, began with. Uh, we've been working together since 2006 uh, when we created a dance theater piece called Love Unpunished about the evacuation of the World Trade Center. Mimi, uh, Mimi installed a, tw uh, this is old video, huh? Uh, Mi Mimi uh, installed a 25 foot steel uh, escape stair in an abandoned movie theater. And we made this piece with a really reduced palette of movement. So it's all just ascents and descents and bodies falling. Um, I think at that time, we really wanted to try to uh, recapture the feeling that was hard to describe in the days right after 9-11 and that had been papered over in the politics by five years later. Um, but this piece really began a discussion, an ongoing dialogue between Mimi and me, Mimi and Pig Iron, about architecture and human behavior and about uh, set design and physical score. Um, Uh, later, Mimi and I worked with uh, Japanese playwright Toshiki Okada. This piece was also at Under the Radar uh, in a piece called Zero Cost House, uh, which was his take on Thoreau's Walden. This is a, another work about the tension between the built environment and the human soul. And then recently in 2017, this was our most ambitious work, uh, 80 performers were in this one, uh, a collaboration with composer filmmaker Troy Harian and several choirs, including The Crossing and Contemporaneous Orchestra. I think we have a small clip of this. Um, Children, elders, and machines contemplate the future. This was uh, another way to imagine emotions that don't really have a name as we contemplate our well, as we contemplate the extinctions that are going on right now. Um, I guess I wanted to just show a little bit of this large light sculpture that Mimi Lian and lighting designer Tyler Michelow designed uh, that creates a series of kind of optical illusions for the audience. Um, Mimi herself has had a pretty busy career in the past couple of years outside of Pig Iron. Uh, she's become known for environmental scenic designs. Uh, in this piece, she, uh, The Great Comet of 1812, she transformed a Broadway theater with, she threaded through walkways and hung chandeliers throughout the space, uh, which won the Tony Award in 2017. That was pretty exciting to for her friends, uh, <laughs> to watch and scream, watching the television. Uh, and uh, uh, also Mimi's practices started to include uh, public art and uh, performance installations. This is a work called Lost in the Meadow, where a radio tower gets constructed in front of an audience in a 140-acre meadow at Longwood Gardens. And the Without Walls Festival commissioned this work, Model Home, uh, in 2017, which is a performance installation and crane ballet. Uh, but um, as Mimi's practice has been expanding, uh, it seemed like the ideal time to do something we've talked about for a long time, which is that Mimi's designs have been really iconic for so much of Pig Iron's work, but we have not begun with Mimi's fascinations. She has come in second and taken it in, uh, shaped the piece. Uh, so much, and uh, we really wanted to find out what would happen if we really begin with Mimi's fascinations and start just with scenic design, and that is the roots of this piece, Superterranean, that we are creating in 2019. Turn over for you for a bit. Hi. So yeah, so given the opportunity to start with a design and nothing else and put uh, performers in the midst of this design, um, I started with the question of like what, you know, what is the intersection between architecture and performance. Um, how can the physical environment dictate human behavior within it? Um, I started thinking about city planning and like how those large-scale designs and structures are meant to control the way that we live. Um, and what, what is the relationship between these constructions and the humans who built them? Um, I've always been really obsessed with spaces that have an inherent drama a kind of suspense and like a almost a palpable gravitational pull on our human, on our bodies. 
Um, so t spaces like tunnels, bunkers, cavernous cisterns, underground cisterns, mostly hidden spaces, actually, which weren't actually designed for human inhabitation. Uh, the spaces uh, that are necessary for systems of modern civilization, like our infrastructure spaces. So there's this tension of scale between the vastness of the spaces and the tiny humans. I mean, this picture, there's not even a human within it. Like, you just have to imagine uh, the scale, <laughs> the, the, the human in, in that. Um, structures that have an inherent intentionality in the design, but are somehow enigmatic. Um, uh, yeah, so I, you know, when I was starting out working on this piece, I think often about this crazy uh, refinery that's by the side of the highway outside of the Holland Tunnel here. I know most of you are not from here, but it's a very um, sort of, you know, maybe alienating looking uh, industrial environment. Um, and yet I found that every time I pass by that, I have this great feeling, this great emotional feeling. And I was trying to figure out what that's about as I was starting to work on this piece. And I realized that when I looked at this, this vast field of machinery, um, it felt like a place that humans didn't belong. Like it's, it's kind of a, built at a non-human scale. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a feeling that we don't belong there or that we are no longer there. It's like a post-human landscape. Um, but, but the emotion that resides within that, I think, is that uh, there's also a sense of like awe and pride at this, uh, this, the complexity of this structure and this network that we humans have in fact built, and yet no, you know, it's also uh, might be the you know our demise. So we've built these enormous structures to contain and control enormous forces and nature, but in the end, they have an effect on us. Um, so these structures like dams and power plants, um, we think that this, this simultaneous unnamed feeling of pride and dread is an analog for the desire to contend with death itself. As we've been developing the piece, we're finding, we're trying to find you know, where the human is within these spaces. We're finding the softness and fleshiness of the human body um, amidst these hard constructions. Um, and our piece will be a, a sequence of actions waiting, maintenance, violence, uh, oozing. This will bring the corporeality um, into the space. So we're still working on developing the design, but uh, there's some sort of preliminary models. We think that the design we're working on is going to involve three states. Uh, the first state is a compressed, very shallow space that has the feeling of being maybe at the bottom of a shaft. Um, and then we move on to uh, a banal room, a human-sized room, human-scaled room, but with a non-human-scaled object in it, a very large industrial object. Um, and then at some point, the room goes away and reveals that the, uh, the object is actually part of a larger system of infrastructure. Uh, these are really rough models. I've started to do a little digital modeling. I'm interested in this, this kind of uh, column structure that has openings that you're not quite sure what, uh, what they are, why they are, um, but they do feel like there's some way for a human to interact with it. Um, and that's a sort of digital rendering of, of that. And I think this is going to have to press play. No? Oh, maybe I didn't. Skip the video. <laughs> um, so, do you want to sure. take it away? Um, so, we've been working on this project for, I guess, a year and a half in, mm -hmm. in, in different phases of development. Um, we are looking towards a premiere with our long-term partners, the Philadelphia Fringe Arts, in 2019. Um, this spring, uh, we're really pleased to be working with the Devised Theatre Initiative here at the Public Theatre, who set up a technical residency for us here in New York at City Tech, um, who will be working with us on prop fabrication and building part of the set and some other technical elements. We are looking for one more technical residency before we 
uh, in the early summer of this summer before we load into a warehouse in the Navy Yard. Um, right, I guess we didn't get to see the audience bank. Move. Oh, yeah, I was going to talk the one about thing. that. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, so I was actually interested in the design, the third stage of the design after we are in the room uh, with the large column that the walls go away and the audience would actually move into the into the set that we've been looking at. So our perspective changes from this um, objective distance to actually being inside of it. Some of the things that we're trying to figure out, um, obviously in a work that begins with design, you have to build the whole thing and set it up in order to develop the script and the score. Uh, this will be a new level of props design and props effects for us. We'll be working with the team at, at City Tech about that. Um, but working with uh, some latex and prosthetics, um, uh, a level of automation of moving pieces, and a sound score, we actually want to score, we don't want to hide the motor noises of some of this automation, but actually work with it w uh, as part of the uh, instrumentation of the piece. And the heating and cooling, uh, yeah. Of this warehouse, yeah. yeah. exactly. Um, and we uh, hope for a future life for the piece. Uh, we're also working with a creative producer, Mei Yin Wang, uh, who people probably know from under the radar, and she'll be around later, later on today. Uh, thanks so much, Andrew, and everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a quick five minutes in case you need to refresh your coffee or get something else to eat uh, while Catherine sets up so we can find out how her DNA extraction is going. Thank you.
fuck this up the proper way. Man. You already. Make sure you let a hundred white people know you do some real gangster shit without just selling your color. Ooh. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Speaking. Microphone. Oh, I know. They all testing. pick that show up because it's about color. Testing. Testing. Let's testing. just be real. Testing. Like, uh, testing. Dog, I've been, testing. I came out of yeah, that's working. Okay. Hi again, everyone. Um, everyone. Does everyone have coffee and supplies? Great. Uh, okay, so we're back and we have supplies. For those who uh, turned up after the last little presentation, uh, we were talking about this hat, which is full of DNA from Berliner Ensemble members, and we were talking about the possibility of getting the DNA off the hat uh, and bringing those Berliner Ensemble members back alive in some form. Uh, and so what we're going to do now is go we're going to extract DNA uh, live on stage. We're not going to extract human DNA, because um, it turns out that this hat, the DNA, is incredibly degraded, and we ended up having to use specialist forensic techniques to get DNA off of it. Um, but what we can do on stage is we can extract DNA from strawberries. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Strawberries are octoploid, which means that where we have two strands of DNA, they have eight strands. So there's tons of DNA in strawberries. Uh, and it means that you can actually extract the DNA from strawberries with equipment that you would just find in your kitchen. So you can do this when you go back home. Um, so we start by freezing the strawberries. These are some pre-frozen strawberries. Uh, and we freeze them because the ice works like a dagger. It cuts through the cell wall uh, and breaks open the cells so that what's inside the cells can swim out into solution. Then we add pineapple juice, which we have here. Now we add pineapple uh, because pineapple contains the enzyme bromelain, and bromelain is used to separate the chromosomes so that the DNA can float free. So let's, seems like a good amount of pineapple juice. Um, we zip this up, and now the really technical part, you need a lot of science for this, you just squish it up like this, Oop, leaking a little. So squash the strawberries into the pineapple. All right, that's probably good. Okay, so hopefully now we have lots of DNA floating around inside this pineapple strawberry mixture. Next, we're going to filter it. Now, you can filter it using a coffee filter, a tea filter. We have a little beaker with a tea filter in it here. So we're going to open this up. And we're going to pour it in here. Now, the reason we filter it is because uh, DNA, DNA is polar. Um, and water is positively charged. DNA is negatively charged. Let me just check that. Water is negatively charged. No, water is positively charged and DNA is negatively charged. Are there any scientists here? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, I did the full version of this for a group of scientists a few, a month ago, and it was terrifying. Uh, so I can just tell you and you'll believe me. All right, so the DNA uh, is negatively charged, the water is positively charged, and so the DNA is attracted to the water, sticks with it, and moves through the filter down here. So we're going to help that along a little bit, like this. Okay, and next step, uh, we're going to add alcohol to it. We're going to add uh, really high proof alcohol. We have some rum here, which is 150 proof. And uh, the reason we do that is because it'll cause the DNA, hopefully, if we do it right, to come up out of this solution into the alcohol. And because DNA is polar, um, it will end up clumping together. And we should be able to see it with the naked eye. So let's see. Here we go. OK, 
Okay, we have to do this very, might wait for the subway to go past. Do this very gently. We want the alcohol to sit on top of the strawberry. I think that's working. Um, let's switch to the live feed. Great, so let's see. We can show you this. There, do you see this white, stringy stuff that's coming up out of the strawberry? That's all of the strawberry DNA. Now, one of the things that I love about microbiology is that for the most part, you can't see anything. It's all submicroscopic. You can't see DNA. You can't see any of the enzymes you're working with. So the only way you can tell what's going on is by the effects, um, which I think is quite poetic and beautiful. But this is one of the instances where you can actually see something with the naked eye. So there's the DNA. Let's see if we can get a little bit. This one. Strawberry DNA right there. <laughs> there it is. So uh, what can we do with this DNA? Well, one of the things that we can do uh, and that we have done with the DNA from the humans is we can send it off to a lab to be sequenced. And um, you can see here, this is a tube full of Carl's DNA. Or rather, I should explain that first. So from this hat, we managed so far to get two hits of DNA. Um, you can see in the next slide. Here it is. Uh, so one of them ended up being mitochondrial uh, DNA haplotype HA1A. Uh, and I've called that one Herman. And the other one ended up being mitochondrial DNA haplotype K. And I called that one Carl. Uh, so Herman came from there, and Carl came from there. I'm assuming they're both men. I can't tell, but it's a soldier's hat. would have been a male costume, and they're from the inside of the hat. So my hypothesis is that these are two, uh, Herman, Herman and Carl. Um, so we can send that off to be sequenced. Uh, once we have the sequence back, there's a number of things we can do. Uh, one of the things that we've done is create a genetically modified theater. Um, so here on our little mini miniature Berliner Ensemble turntable, you can see maybe here, uh, Karl is red for Karl Marx, Hermann is green, uh, and this is the DNA, the human DNA, spliced together with DNA from a phosphorescing jellyfish and then implanted into a plasmid and grown in a bacteria. So here you have um, two uh, Hermann and Karl plus their jellyfish bacteria partners growing on this little Petri dish right here. Uh, another thing that we can do is take Brecht's words and actually translate them into DNA base codes and insert them into a bacteria and see what they express. We can uh, translate in the opposite direction as well. Uh, so say you had some friends who are composers and percussionists. You could send them the score or you could send them the DNA sequence for one of these individuals and ask them to create a score based on that sequence, uh, which we've done and which you will hear shortly. Uh, finally, what we can do is we can make you a drink. So we're gonna go and we're gonna wait. Wow, look at that. We're gonna wait for this to fully extract. Uh, and when we come back, uh, we will turn these into cocktails for all of you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so while they clear the stage, uh, I will vamp by continuing my pitch from earlier about incoming. I have to say that Catherine uh, and also Flaco Jimenez, who you'll meet in a minute, were both in Device Theater Working Group incoming series in years past. And also minor character, 
50-50 old school animation and James and Jerome all came through incoming. So if you are people who pride yourselves on seeing things before they're the thing, which I think you do, uh, go see incoming because that's where they're coming from. Uh, we're almost clear here. Um, the last pitch we're going to have before we go back to Catherine is uh, with the, the great Flaco Jimenez. Uh, Flaco, you want to come on out here? Because we'll, we'll get you Hello. situated. Gotta Flaco. Sure no DNA <laughs> stuff happens to the show. <laughs> we don't ruin the DNA. Respect the DNA. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, is everybody here for the Flaco Taxilandia tour? Yeah. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. Is everybody here for the Flaco Taxilandia tour? Yeah. Let's get a rock and let's get a rock and so. Let's take a walk. We're going to wait for the computer guy to get here so I can give you what I got to give you up here. So Modesto Flaco Jimenez from Bushwick, Brooklyn, and I created a show that takes place in a car. Uh, the car goes around Brooklyn, and I will give you the rest once we plug that sexy machinery in. Nice. Look at all your beautiful faces. Mm. Y'all enjoying that breakfast? That's that free-free. Get that free-free in, because y'all going to have a lot of walking to do today. <laughs> Little mini muffin. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't want a whole muffin. You don't need that. That's not good for you. Just a little drip of that drip-drip coffee, because it's not regular coffee. It's drip coffee. Coño, pero verdad, Dios mío. Gucci? Yeah, I'm not talking about a desert. Here we go. Let's get it. <laughs> um, so everybody's here for the Flaco Taxilandia tour? Yeah. All right, let's take a walk and chop it up, right? Let me talk to you about Albizu. Talk to you about Monica y Clemente. Meet la señora Yolanda. Give me some Yolanda. Meet la señora Yolanda y su fritura. Y'all want some pig intestine? Y'all ain't never had pig intestines like hers. Welcome to Bushwick, Brooklyn, the mecca of cool and grimy, according to Vogue. <laughs> My name is Flaco, and I grew up here. I used to love to sell bootleg CDs in front of McDonald's. It was easier than selling crack. Crack sells itself. Um, I mean, the hours were better, nine to eight like a store. Plus, police fucks with you less, right? You get a ticket instead of jail time. It was, it was Wattsworth Department Store. No, 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 I mean it was SEM. No, 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 it was s and Lady Store. No, 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 it was Shopper's World. Shopper's World will open up and I will lay my CD mat down and I'll lay all those Spanish tracks over here. Vallenatos in the middle, cumbias next to that, and then all hip hop. I'm in love with Bushwick, Brooklyn, and all its complications. I began these tours to figure out a way to bridge the divide. Let us get in this taxi, and let me show you the Brooklyn I know, that I don't hear about in these walking tours, these papers, or online blogs. Who wants to go on a tour with me? Uh, come up. Sit right here, mama. You want? Come up here. Who else want to go? I need somebody from the back. I like people walking before they get in my car. Come on. So we're going to wait for my passengers to get here. But just know that this tour has got that coffee drip. <laughs> now time for my cab rules. Rule number one, as a Flaco Taxilandia tour passenger, you have the right to make art where art does not exist. Talk jail, poetry, platanos, Boswick, the new Brooklyn, and everything in between. Rule number two, take a ride through these original Lenape Indian blocks, listen to how they got hustled by the boy P.D. Stuyvesant, some French immigrants, Dutch settlers, and 40 men capable of bearing arms. Rule number three, you have no power over this cab radio. I will play what I want. 
And if y'all get saucy, I'll just play 10, 10 wins the whole ride. <laughs> Rule number four, let's fail forward and not be refused life services based on your race, ethnicity, cultural background, disability, gender, or sexual orientation, and deal with all the shit I just mentioned without fighting in my car. Enjoy the ride, mi gente. <laughs> Taxilandia is an immersive theatrical taxi tour of a neighborhood near you, crafted for each locale. That's Urban Avenue. I'll break you down and talk to you about the crack spot that was there, then the mural that got put out with the kid got shot, then the high school that I went to. We already have the car. With the support of Franklin Furnace, that's the man that helps me pump gas. That's the Coney Island guy I drive to sell birds. There he is. And turtles, by the way. He sells more turtles than birds. <laughs> and Bushwick High School, like I told you. We already have the car with the support of Franklin Furnace and can't wait to work with you to find your Bushwick, Brooklyn, and tell your stories. Four audience members are taking on a trip to the Tapestry of America from the back seat of, a cat, of my cat. The car is geared up with cameras inside and out. She's a, a lady that sells herself at night, doesn't put the picture, but always pays me great, and she only calls me. I watched that little kid grow. Me and his brother were gang members together. He gives me free McDonald's because I take him home. The story of a neighborhood, the story of America and its ever-changing landscape. You might have seen my solo show on Under the Radar, part of the device theater work. You were dropping them hints over there. Um, shout out to them for taking care of many sides of theater development. I was able to also workshop a stage version of Taxilandia at Prelude this year, and I got that video for you if you need it. Talk to Jane, our producer over there, and our video killer over there if you want later so he can tell you how we're souping up this car to be able to live stream into your theater. Um, yeah, huh? Drip. <laughs> She passed out in my car, it was her birthday, her family stole all her money and I had to take her home for free. It took me an hour to get her up. That was nine people that got in the cab to celebrate her birthday. She goes to church every Sunday to sing, came out in the New York Times, always mentions it to me before paying me to see if I could give her a discount. <laughs> uh, of course, the beautiful projects of Central and Parmetto, right across the street from the school so the kids can see what can happen if they don't focus. Reality, Bushwick, Brooklyn, and I'm able to give you that. And that's my show. Thank you very much for the beautiful five minutes. Thank you, Thank you Flacco. All right. Uh, as promised, we're going to wrap things up with Catherine. Uh, so Catherine Hamilton, please come to the stage. Thank you. Uh, so here we are. You can see there's tons of DNA floating around in that strawberry solution. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to turn this into cocktails and then serve them to all of you. Um, Jude and Mike are going to set up some drums on the stage to play you that score I spoke about. Uh, while they do, let's go over to the bar. So, um, as you saw when we were making this, pretty much every, well, everything that went into this uh, is consumable. So the next step is to hand it over to Jacqueline who is going to pour the entire thing into a cocktail shaker. All right, now that's in the cocktail shaker. Uh, first up, we're going to make a Herman. No, a Carl. A Carl. First up, we're going to make a Carl. So here's Carl's DNA from the lab. And now for a Carl, we add some agave. We add some Aperol. Uh, we add a little bit more strawberry and pineapple juice. Uh, and then we shake it all up in the shaker. I'm going to give it a shake, Jacqueline. Here we go. Yeah. And then uh, we're going to filter that into a glass. Now the final step for Carl is that we take some DNA from this, which I have here, and we infuse it into a maraschino cherry. Up there, thanks. These ones have been pre-infused. So, this maraschino cherry contains Carl's DNA, and once the drink is made, we drop the maraschino cherry in there, and it's ready to go. Strong. Uh, for, 
for the Herman, we do the same thing, except this one is made with green tea, uh, absinthe, and gin, and some soda water. Uh, and Carl's DNA is infused onto a sugar cube. Uh, and so when you drop that sugar cube into the drink, the DNA will, uh, with the soda water, will come up into the drink. Uh, so we're going to distribute these to all of you so everyone has one. Uh, and as we distribute them, I just want to remind you, at the beginning I said tonight's performance will take place in your small intestine. Okay, so this is that bit. So uh, this is how DNA gets broken down. It passes mostly uh, whole through your system until it gets to the small intestine. In the small intestine, you start to break it down into its component amino acids. These amino acids are then reabsorbed back up into your system and used to build your own proteins. So as you're drinking it, just think about taking up Carl and Herman uh, into your own body. And uh, from the point of view of theater, it's about the most intense method acting you can get. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to start to distribute these now. Uh, there's a Carl, which is red for Karl Marx, easy to remember. There's a Herman, which is green. Uh, and there's non-alcoholic versions of both of them. So make sure to, to grab whichever one you prefer. Uh, and remember to put your sugar cube or your cherry into it so that you get the DNA. Um, so as they do that, I'm going to say what you've seen uh, this morning is a kind of small part of a larger research project. Uh, we have different components to this piece. We have, um, uh, we have an art installation. We have an uh, education uh, endeavor called the School for Genetically Modified Theater. Um, and we have a theater piece, which you can bring to your theaters right now. Uh, there's an expanded version of this lecture performance that you've seen tonight, and we're uh, starting to tour it. We're ready to tour it. So uh, if you're interested, please come up and talk to one of us later while you're drinking your cocktails. Um, and the final thing I'm going to say as these start to slowly get distributed around uh, is uh, that yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, once everyone has one, we're gonna do a toast, we're gonna cheers to Carl and Herman, and then Mike and Jude, who are up there on the stage ready, are going to play a one minute version of the score they created from Herman's DNA. Uh, and after they've done that, feel free to uh, hang around, mingle, talk to the artists, enjoy your cocktails, uh, do your trio with, with Carl and Herman. So, I'm gonna help. Hand these round. Let's make sure everyone gets a cocktail. Let's swap for this one. Uh, I think with, yeah, they look like they're with alcohol. Yes. Okay, so because it's taking a bit longer to distribute the cocktails than we thought, we're going to go ahead and we're going to play Herman and then we're going to cheers afterwards. So here's Herman.
Thank you so much. Um, uh, so as Catherine said, let's take a moment to cheers under the radar with some DNA cocktails. Yeah. Cheers. And thank you so much, guys. Uh, so they're going to continue to play. Stick around. We have another like 10 minutes, 15 minutes before we have to vacate. Um, thank you so much for coming to Coming Attractions, and we'll see you at the festival.